Learn the most advanced recruiting techniques. Land the most desirable talent. Launch your company towards massive success. This is the Higher Power Radio Show with Rick Gerard. Today we're talking about interviewing for conversational capacity. So conversational capacity, what is it? It's the ability to balance candor and curiosity under pressure. Critical elements to every entrepreneur and business leader who are building an organization. There's my fumble for today. There you go. And yet this element is often overlooked in the hiring process. Great news, it can be taught. Today's quote, the single biggest problem in communication is the the illusion that it has been taking place. Any idea who said that, Craig? George Bernard Shaw. You know it. Woo! I'm Rick Gerard, and welcome to the Higher Power Radio Show. Our mission is to provide proven tactical solutions to solve your company's toughest hiring challenges. We share insights from top-performing entrepreneurs and industry experts like our guest today, Mr. Craig Weber. Craig is the founder of Weber Consulting Group, which is an alliance of experts committed to helping build more resilient, healthy, and agile organizations. He helps people and teams dramatically improve their performance by treating dialogue as a discipline. Craig is also the author of the best-selling book, Conversational Capacity, The Secret to Building Successful Teams That Perform When the Pressure Is On. Craig, welcome to the Higher Power Radio Show today. Thank you very much for having me, Ray. Oh, it's great to have you. I know I've been chasing you for like a year trying to get you on this show. Well, I appreciate the invitation. I'm glad this worked (laughs) out. All right. So today we're going to cover what is conversation capacity and why is it important Um, We're going to talk about how to interview someone and accurately evaluate their conversational capacity. And we're going to teach you guys what you can implement today that that can help you hire and manage stronger. Sound good? Sounds fantastic. All right. So let's start with conversational capacity. What is it? I know I gave a little brief definition, which you gave me the other day. So I cheated. But uh, yeah, give me the full 411. Perfect. Absolutely. And uh, I'll define it in two ways. Okay. Quickly, what I call the dictionary definition, you could say that conversational capacity refers to the ability, and this can be of an individual or an entire team. It's the ability to have constructive learning-focused dialogue about difficult subjects in challenging circumstances and across tough boundaries. Got it. And so it's easy to see in a team. High conversational capacity, they can put their most difficult, painful, divisive issue on the table and do really good work around it. Low conversational capacity, a minor difference of opinion will screw up a meeting. Yeah. And so, so you can have a lot of smart people around the table, but if the conversational capacity is too low, you can't get access to their smarts. And that usually happens when you have somebody who's dominant and a people who maybe aren't so dominant, right? And they don't know how to communicate properly. Exactly. Sometimes okay. you get two or three people who are dominating the meeting and talking over everybody else and a bunch of other really smart people who are sitting there on their hands, not putting their ideas or their concerns on the table. So, so for a tech company, that might be the VP of sales would be the the dominant person, and then the engineering staff tends to be the other route. That could, that's, that could easily be the case, yeah. right? And so you have some people, because of the roles they're in, tend to have a more dominant personality, perhaps a slightly more aggressive conversational style. Sure. And that can often have the inadvertent consequence of pushing a lot of other people away from the table when you need to be pulling them toward it. So high conversational capacity, you don't just have smart people around the table. You're able to get access to their smarts, even if they have different roles, functions, personalities, technical backgrounds everyone's able to stay engaged in the conversation and add value. Low conversational capacity, and that breaks down pretty quickly. Okay, so you want to have high conversational capacity. Yeah, it's sort of, a, I think, an underappreciated aspect of both building and leading a really good teams, right? We, we pay attention to a lot of other factors, but I think something that's not on our management dashboard and what I've been trying to do with my work is get people to pay more attention to it. And one thing that's fun about talking to you is that we've been talking a little bit to gear up for this is, you know, I tend to work on the backside of this. You've yeah. got the team in place. So how do you build your team's conversational capacity? It's kind of fun thinking about it from this side. What, what about the hiring process and how do you get people at the table who are going to help build your conversational capacity and not cripple it? How are you going to evaluate for that? Yeah, right? exactly in, in right. Yes, it's kind of a subset of EQ in a way, right? Yeah. In fact, um, someone recently reviewed my book online and they said conversational capacity is in essence operationalized emotional intelligence, which I kind of like. So. Okay. And so it's not just you should, technical you should expertise. You trademark that real quickly. I really should, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I like that idea. How can you make sure that you don't just have a lot of smart technical people around the table, but they have the emotional and social intelligence to harness their smarts in the service of making good decisions, running good meetings, managing change effectively, really good problem solving when you need it? Besides the obvious, which yes. is, I mean, communication is key, especially if you're going to build a company. 
But why is it important other than that? Well, I think, you know, really good, balanced, rigorous dialogue is essential to almost every activity in running a good business, right? From formulating and implementing strategy, managing change, giving performance feedback, running effective meetings. And so it's sort of the the base on which a lot of other business activities sit, and yet it's something we're not paying as much attention to, which in some ways seems crazy. How could we be ignoring something that is so foundational in terms of building a team, a business, or an organization that's really working well when it counts? Well, if you think about it, most people don't even pay that much attention to their spouse. <laughs> maybe maybe this could be a whole other avenue for you. Yeah, well, my background's in organizational development and organizational psychology, so I'm not going to take it there, but uh, yeah, it's foundational. So, like I say, you can have all the right people around the table, a great product or service, a killer strategy in place, all the resources your team or your business needs at its disposal. But if the conversational capacity of the group is too low, given the work you're asking it to do, it is going to underperform. And it's going to fail. And yeah, exactly. So you, p- people often pay a pretty steep price when conversational capacity is too low. So that's that one definition, constructive learning focused dialogue when and where it counts. And the second definition you uh, kind of uh, alluded to in the opening, and that is there's what I call the sweet spot in a good conversation. And the sweet spots where, again, you don't just have smart people around the table. You can get access to their best thinking, their biggest concerns. You can get access to their smarts. And what holds people in the sweet spot is this balance, as you described it, between these two things. On the one hand, the conversations are very candid. So candor is key. Yep. The conversations are honest. They're open. They're forthright. They're direct. It's no nonsense, but that can easily turn into a, you know, an argument or a heated discussion. Oh yeah, very quickly. And so it needs to be tempered with lots of curiosity. People are open-minded. They're inquisitive. They're there to learn. When you see things differently than I do, I don't get pissed off or upset. I get interested. Wow. Rick hates my idea. That's interesting. What's he picking up on here? Yeah. Why? That's exactly right. Why? What's going on? Yeah. What, what am I missing here is what the question you should be asking. That is a fantastic question. In fact, I often guess people to say there's three questions. If you want to stay in that sweet spot, candid and curious, three questions you and your team can constantly be asking are, what am I seeing about this issue others are missing? I need to put my two cents on the table because I may have a unique perspective that illuminates the issue in a way. What are other people seeing that I'm missing? Do I have a blind spot? And then what are we all missing? Do we have a collective blind spot here? Are there other organizations dealing with similar problems? And what might we learn from how they're approaching it? And so I think that question you described, you know, what am I missing here? That's a great one to constantly be reflecting on. And ego has a lot to play with this, right? Yeah. How do you get past the barrier if somebody's got a huge ego? That I is e. tough. VP of sales. No. Right. <laughs> I keep I'm looking at you. <laughs> in fact, I describe in the book conversational capacity as a conversational martial art. And there's a risk in framing it that way, where Ooh, you immediately like begin thinking, okay, I'm going to use this against my team. But in this conversational martial art, to your point, your opponent is never the people you're talking to. It's not the issue you're trying to address or even the context in it's which the you problem operate. You're trying to solve. Well, actually, I think it's your ego. Okay. If you want to stay in that sweet spot, focused on learning, constructive learning focused dialogue, your ego is is your enemy. You got to take your ego to the mat. So learning and and making smart decisions needs to be far more important to you at a gut level than being comfortable or being right. So I like this notion that if we want to be better leaders and run better businesses and teams, we actually have to become better people, less ego driven and more <laughs> purpose driven in the way we approach conversations about issues that really count. Which is very utopian in thought, but Will it really happen? That's a good question. And I think what you need to show people is the price they're paying when their ego is running the show, right? And there's two prices people tend to pay. One is, uh, you know, in terms of their personal effectiveness, right? What's it costing them in terms of their ability to lead a team, build a business, grow a company? Their personal brand. Yes. And and that's the other one, the reputation. So yeah. exactly right. You nailed it. So their personal brand, that's better said than I would have said it. Yeah. yeah. So you're paying a price in terms of your effectiveness, but you're also paying a price in terms of your reputation or your personal brand. And when people recognize clearly what it's costing them to let their ego run the show, that's when you may, they're, they're unlikely to make the change to their behavior if they don't see those two things. So you need to show them what's it costing them. And then what are the advantages they gain if they make some improvements? I would imagine, too, it affects their bottom line from a cash flow perspective of their personal income as well. Absolutely. They won't see it in most cases. Like, I'm crushing it right now, but, like, you could be crushing it that much more. Absolutely. What's the delta between what you could be gaining and what you've got right now? You may be doing okay, but if you actually dialed your behavior back a little bit and built your conversational capacity so you're pulling your smart people toward the table rather than pushing them away from it, how much more effective would you be? Look, I'm a short, bald guy with Napoleon complex, so, I mean, (laughs) I have to keep my ego in check. Well, we all do. (laughs) Right. I think I realized just over the past few years that, gosh, keeping your ego in check and just being humble and 
and really looking to others, it makes a huge impact. And, and you just hit another um, kind of key point, I think. I talk in the book, I expand the sweet spot where it's candor, yes, but sometimes speaking up, raising your hand, putting two cents on the table takes courage. It's not yeah. an easy thing to do. And so candor and courage are key, but it's balanced with curiosity and humility. So high conversational capacity, you're curious and you're humble. It's not about your ego. You're more about learning. You're trying to help other people get their ideas on the table, not just get your own on the table. Uh, and so I like that. Candor and, candor and courage balanced with curiosity and humility is the environment you want to work. And I think it's the kind of people you want to try to pull in. If you're just joining us on the live stream or the podcast, you're listening to the Higher Power Radio Show. I'm your host, Rick Gerard, And today our guest is Craig Weber, the fabulous Craig Weber with Weber <laughs> Consulting Group. And uh, we're talking about conversational capacity. This was a new concept to me when I, I saw you speak about it. I thought it was really, you did a phenomenal job on kind of educating me. And I'm like, gosh, am I, am I the flamethrower or am I the, I, like, I couldn't figure <laughs> out which guy I was, right? So let's talk about how we can recognize or evaluate people in the interview process. I know that's a little bit more on my side of things, but we talked a little bit about looking for evidence in an interview that would suggest that somebody is open for that. So right. if you've got a company where you're very protective of your culture, which a lot of smaller startup companies are, it's all about culture, making a bad hire can be detrimental to the company. How do we evaluate for that? So I think structuring your interview in a capacity where you're gathering evidence of whether or not somebody has been in that sweet spot in their career. Right. And what are the conversational tendencies they bring to the team? Is there a good fit, you could say, between what not just their technical abilities, but their social skills. Is the way this person's is the way this person is wired, is it going to serve uh, building the conversational capacity of my team or might it work against it to some degree? And so people bring... That's a fine line. It is. It's a tough one. And it's hard to evaluate up front, I think. It's not an easy thing because there's so many complex interdependent variables, everything from personality, my background, how strongly I feel about an issue. Did I have breakfast this morning? I mean, all <laughs> these variables can determine not just are we in the sweet spot, but which way we leave it? Because when something really difficult comes up, some people are prone to shut down, acquiesce, cave in, and agree. So they tend to minimize the level of discomfort, disagreement, tension, or conflict in a situation. Sure. Other people are a little more prone, and we all know these people, uh, to the candor side of things. So under pressure, they get more direct, they get louder, they stop listening, they start dominating the conversation. And so I worked with a team a while back at a company I won't name where they brought in some Someone. And this is a team that put a lot of work into building their conversational capacity, getting people on the same page, help them create a conversational code of conduct even. So there's a, a, a set of behavioral norms for how we're going to operate. And they brought Which someone are kind in. of their values. Exactly. Okay. Their values and specific behaviors they're going to they agree to. They brought in someone who on paper was perfect uh, and a really good oh, person. God, don't do that. But uh, their, their conversational style was extremely aggressive. They just come out of the military master sergeant and the way they began interacting with the team was doing a stunning amount of damage to the culture they built. I bet. And so it was a, a poor fit in some ways. Now they were able to help this person recognize, you know, if they were able to pull him in and help him adjust his behavior to fit the team. So they didn't lose his technical abilities. But I think, how might you avoid that process and uh, that problem in the future? Like, how do you hire someone who's a better fit for a team you've been building? Well, really, the only two tools that you have are a personality assessment, and there's various ones out there. I'm not going to talk about those. But in the interview itself, what happens mostly in an interview is bias comes into play. And, well, gosh, I like this guy. He's got the skills, and they hire based on skills rather than cultural fit. Right. So one of the tools that we talk about a lot and we use in our practice is we use behavioral interviewing. Yes. Because behavioral interviewing gives you evidence to make a determination. And I think really when you're making an, a hiring decision, it really comes down to loading your gut up with the right information rather than assumed information, which is what most companies do. Well said. Let's talk a little bit about a few interview questions. Yeah, that we yeah. Do. And you know, we've got a few minutes. Let's do like a mock interview. Yeah, we could try something like that. That'd be kind of fun. Well, one reason I like your focus on these behavioral events interviews is um, a problem you often see in people, and it's a major blind spot. And that is, People often believe they tend to behave one way when, in fact, they be behave another. So totally. they can be very honest with you in, a, in, a, in an interview. They can be genuinely sincere in their belief that they behave this way. If you say, listen, you're in a meeting and your boss puts out an idea and you realize it'll cost more money than it saves. So you want to speak up. How would you respond? And they will tell you how they think they will respond. And they're honest. And, they're, and you might go, yeah. wow, that's and, a great example. But those are situationals. 
And those are hypotheticals. Yeah. And so you're not really getting an accurate depiction of, exactly. of who that person is. The behavioral is, let's talk about a time where you've had this situation what happened and how did you handle it? Exactly. And that's right? why behavioral events interviews are so much more powerful because it oh, gets yeah. you out of that trap of listening to someone say what they think they do and not getting what they would actually do. And what's wonderful about a behavioral interview is you really only need three or four questions. Yeah. And the only follow-up questions you have to ask is why? Right. Or how did that work? Or what did you do? I mean, so, and then what'd you do, right? Yes. And it's just really easy follow-ups just to take it down like a few more layers to really find out where the motivations right. come from. And so a great question. I, we talked about these uh, in our preparation for this, but uh, one of my favorite questions you can ask is, what was your family dinner table like growing up? You can learn a lot from the, if you think about it, your family <laughs> dinner table oh, yeah. is without a doubt the longest workshop you'll ever attend. It's literally, you know, 18 <laughs> if, of the most, had four, if table. you had it, well, even then, then that's also an interesting workshop, yeah. right? If you tended to have dinner in your room alone, uh, that's also going to have an impact. I had a hot pocket. I sat in front of the TV and I waited for dad to come home. That it's that itself but, is telling, That's right? not me, by the way, but that's... <laughs> sure. <laughs> sorry, <right>. mom. <laughs> 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 you know, the, another one that we, we were talking about too, was um, tell me about a time when you had a negative problem that came up that you had to report up the chain to your boss. Yes. How did you handle it? That's a really interesting... So let's try that. So <laughs> Craig, I'm going to call you Bob today. Okay. Bob Craig. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about a time you had a negative information that you had to deliver to your boss. How did you deliver it to your boss? Um, years ago, I was hired by someone who actually told me the reason I was hired is because I was you know, very straightforward, very direct, uh, and that's what they were looking for. Um, when I, and he actually said we hire and promote people who tell it to us like it is. So I thought, this is great. This is exactly the kind of environment I want to work in. As I got busy in the role, I began to realize... They're probably lying, right? <laughs> I, I think No, I don't think lying, but um, <laughs> definitely their behavior didn't line up with their rhetoric. Got and it. so they didn't like bad news. They tended to argue, you know, shut down people, ask a lot of biting questions. People refer to the style as the Gestapo interrogation. So, uh, so on it. the one hand, they're saying, we want you to speak up. On the other hand, when you did, you got slapped down. And so I decided I was going to take a risk and actually bring this up with my boss. How'd that go? Uh, it was scary. How so, did you feel about that? Uh, well, I actually got some help from a couple of colleagues before I did it. So, and they were actually advising me not to do it, which is interesting. They said, don't do it. But, uh, you know, I, so I, I decided to do a little role playing, practice with my colleagues and went and had the conversation. And I pointed out that on the one hand, I appreciate the fact that timely action information is a value here. And I was actually brought in because I was seen as more direct. Yeah. On the other hand, I'm seeing behavior from not just you, but from others that actually contradicts that. That's actually making hard for people to speak up. So if you don't mind, can I give you a couple of quick examples of what I've been seeing and then bounce it off you? So and what was the reaction to that? At first, a little defensive. Uh, I think make, making a mountain out of a molehill didn't really uh, see it as a big issue. Denial first. A little bit. Yeah. Little bit, and yeah. I think that, uh, you know, at first they just didn't see it as, as serious an issue. Or if, yeah, if there are people people out there having trouble, let me know. We'd be happy to get them some help, you know, some assertiveness training, whatever helps solve the problem. But they began to see eventually, and it worked out pretty well, where they began to see there's some, you know, some of their behavior was perhaps working against their, uh, their good intentions. What was the result of you delivering that information to them? Probably lost about five pounds in sweat. Uh, it was one of the first things. <laughs> but secondly, we ended up had a, a meeting where he brought the, we brought this up as a team. So uh, rather okay. than just the two of us try to solve the problem, uh, my boss actually decided to bring this up with the team and to talk about how do we get past this. I want I need to hold people accountable. I need to have hard hitting, pragmatic discussions. You know, I got to make tough decisions. You're not always going to like. How do I do those sort of things in a way that doesn't make you feel like I'm not listening or I'm overbearing? So you were able to affect change. In a way, yeah. And a part of the, I guess, you know, it's not just me, right? It was, I, I mean, I raised my hand and spoke up, but someone else was there to listen and actually do so. I could have gone a very different way. Now, how did you specifically deliver that message to them? I think the opening line I used is, uh, you know, I've been here for six, eight weeks, and I applaud the fact that, you know, being timely, accurate information is something that's highly valued here. On the other hand, I'm now seeing after a little bit of time here that a lot of the behavior around this place contradicts that. Pretty straightforward. You, pre you prepared a really good opening. That was some good candor. Yeah. So I tried. And <laughs> it, 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 what was helpful is the role playing. So I actually worked with yeah. a couple of colleagues to help me prepare for that conversation because I just, I was extremely nervous. That is normally not something I would go in and do. All right. So that might be an example of a you know a behavioral interview. You know, what's this? How's this person just a wired? Question that they wouldn't cover that. Yeah. What what do they bring to the table in terms of conversation? What are the kind of behaviors I might expect from them if, we, if from them if we bring them into the workplace? Usually on the adverse side, if it's somebody who's a really ego maniacal person, you're gonna you're gonna get a much different. Oh yeah, I told them. Answers. I told. Oh yeah, I told them, and they weren't listening to me. Yeah, 
Yeah, I didn't last long in that role. You know, boy, I tell you what, I went in there and let him know, no uncertain terms that, you know, I don't care what you say. And, you know, you don't, you weren't running a, a, a total to nightmare. Her. Yeah. And if you don't yeah. change, I'm walking. You know, they didn't listen to me. So I just walked. Well, I didn't exactly walk. I kind of got the boo, but still, I was, I was going to leave anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and so a great that, question for them. that happens quite a bit. It does. But you know what? If you don't ask those questions, you don't get that evidence ever. Exactly. Right. And a great question to ask to kind of look for that would be, tell me about a time in your career where you were really, really wrong about someone or something, an issue, a decision, or about a person. And how did you handle that? That's going to be a hard one for someone with a big ego to talk about, right? And if you see them really struggling to come up with an example, that's interesting. I was like, well, most Ooh. people have no shortage of examples, but it's that un- either you, I can't access it because I buried it, I don't want to think about it, or I don't want to share it because it kind of yeah, gets lo- in the way of the, f- the presentation I want to uh, make. I love taking people out of their comfort zone in an interview, not making them uncomfortable, but taking them out of their canned responses. Yes. And that completely gets somebody out of their canned responses. Right. All right, man, we're out of time for today's show. Wow. You believe that? That's really quick. so fast. Craig, thanks for your time investment today. My and, pleasure. Uh, welcome to the Higher Power Radio community. Now, I'm sure that uh, a lot of members are going to want to pick up your book or find out more about you. How do they reach you? Uh, you can, my website, conversationalcapacity.com, makes it easy. I'm uh, very active on LinkedIn, so feel free yes, to reach out there. And then on Amazon.com, you can get Conversational Capacity or 800CEOread.com or barnesandnoble.com. So available in print and in uh, electronic format. And we'll have a uh, link to your books on our show notes. Okay, so. If people have questions, feel free to reach out. All right. I want to thank our listening audience for tuning into this week's episode of Higher Power. A quick thanks to our team, our engineer, Paul Roberts. Our producers, Andrea Ballin, Shanti Ryle, and Ayla Gerard. If you're listening to the podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review. We need your feedback to up our level of game this year because we're really, really wanting to bring some really valuable content to you. And join the Higher Power Radio community at higher, that's H-I-R-E, powerradio.com. Or you can follow us on iTunes, Higher Heart, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, and YouTube. Tune in next week. Our guest and I will actually be discussing if AI really improves the recruiting experience. And that's going to be with Liren Kotzer, who's the founder and CEO of Woo.io. I'm your host, Rick Gerard, and you have been listening to the Higher Power Radio Show. Aloha. Thank you for listening to Higher Power with Rick Gerard on OC Talk Radio.